So back when we were looking at continuous functions and continuity, we proved the extreme value theorem. And this is like a real analysis version of the extreme value theorem that doesn't say anything about derivatives. And it said that if f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, then there exists x1 and x2 in a, b, such that f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to f of x2 for all x in a, b. Now I wanna point out that under this setup, we have f of x1 is the minimum of the function on this interval a to b, and f of x2 is the maximum of this function on the closed interval a, b. So what this is saying is that every continuous function on a closed interval attains a minimum and a maximum on that interval. Now I wanna compare and contrast that with the calculus one extreme value theorem. That is the one that you learn in a calculus one class. And that says all of this stuff with the addition of the extreme value occurs when the derivative equals zero or the derivative does not exist or at the end points. So I wanna prove a theorem today using the careful definition of differentiability and the notion of the derivative so that we can link these two theorems together. And so in particular, the theorem that I wanna prove goes like this. So let's let f be differentiable on the open interval a to b. And notice that implies that it's continuous on the open interval a to b by something that we proved earlier. Then we'll show that if f attains a maximum or a minimum at c, which is on the interval a to b, then f prime of c is equal to zero. So here we're assuming that it's differentiable everywhere here. Now I wanna point out that this is actually enough information to prove the rest of these cases here. That is to prove that the extreme value can also occur at the endpoints or where the derivative does not exist. So maybe somebody fill in those details in the comments um, if you are interested. Okay, let's go ahead and get to this proof. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna suppose that I've got C in AB such that F of X is less than or equal to F of C for all X in AB. In other words, we have a maximum here. Now I wanna notice that the interval A to B is an open interval and thus an open set. So that means that there exists some epsilon bigger than zero such that the epsilon neighborhood, so V epsilon centered at C, is totally contained in this open interval A, B. And just as a reminder, this epsilon neighborhood, V epsilon C, is equal to the open interval C minus epsilon C plus epsilon. Great. Now, what I wanna do from here is define two sequences one that converges to C from below and one that converges to C from above. And we'll see how those are gonna be useful. So let's define X in first. So that'll be the sequence that converges to C from below. So we're gonna have this be equal to C minus epsilon over N plus one. And now what I wanna notice is that this xn converges to c and all of these values of xn are less than epsilon because we're subtracting a positive number. But the positive number that we're subtracting is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Furthermore, we know that this xn is in this epsilon neighborhood and thus it is in the open interval a to b. Now we're gonna do a similar thing with a yn sequence. So let's define yn to be c plus epsilon over n plus one. And here I wanna notice that yn also converges to c as a sequence. And these yn's are all bigger than c because they're c plus a positive number. Okay, great. And then now let's also notice the following fact. And that is since f of c is a maximum, we know that f evaluated at the values of this sequence 
give us a smaller than or equal to value of f of c. In other words, we know that f of x sub n is less than f of c, and f of y sub n is also less than f of c. And I should put less than or equal to there. Great. And again, let's go ahead and point out why that is the case. That's because f of c is a maximum. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is use these two sequences to look at the derivative of f at c two different ways. So here, we'll maybe put the derivative of f at c here in the middle. And then over on this side, we'll write it as the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n minus f of c over x sub n minus c. So notice that is essentially the definition of the derivative. It's just we're using a sequential definition of the derivative instead of um, the standard definition of the derivative, but they're completely equivalent. But now notice that's also going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of f of y sub n minus f of c over y sub n minus c for the same reason. Okay, now I want to make the following really important observation, and that is that this limit is most definitely bigger than or equal to zero, and that's because the argument of this limit is always bigger than or equal to zero. So notice that the numerator is always less than or equal to zero because f of c is a maximum, and then the denominator is always strictly less than zero by our construction of the sequence x sub n. And now also we have this guy over here is always less than or equal to zero for essentially the same reason. Notice the numerator is always less than or equal to zero by the maximality of f of c. And then the denominator is always bigger than zero by our construction of y n. So let's see what we have going on here. So we've got the derivative of f at c. So we know that exists because we're assuming differentiability on this open interval and c is on the open interval. So the derivative of the f at c is simultaneously bigger than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero. But that only leaves one possibility for its actual value and that is zero. So, and that's our conclusion that f prime of c is equal to zero. And so, like I said, we proved this for the case when f attains a maximum at c, but a completely parallel argument will work if f attains a minimum at c. So maybe I would say for practice, you should probably close your notebook on this and try to rewrite the proof for the minimum case, kind of using the same strategy that we saw here. And again, maybe post in the comments if you think of a way to take the result of this theorem and fill in the remaining two details that bump our extreme value theorem up to the calculus one extreme value theorem. And that's a good place to stop.